It's 4 o'clock on a Tuesday, and you know what that means. It's time for another exciting episode of Taxi's Quarantini Happy Hour. Woohoo! And thank you, fake band. Thank you, fake audience. Let's see who's in the chat room today. Hello, everybody. We have Dan Weber, Bob Gunnerfeld, Dan Weber again, Darren Moss, Bob Gunnerfeld again, Marion Laird, Greg Carroza. Wait for the room to fill up here as the big old notification goes out. Mary Walker, Rick Cabot Podmore, Edmund Red, Dean Turner. What a cast of characters, Tony Tolazzo, Andre Stepanian. I'm always so encouraged when I see you guys say hello in the chat room. It's like I know all the tech is working. Ah, Daryl Berman, Windchimes Music. Marion Laird. Diaries. Watching via phone. Good idea. Maybe your bandwidth will be good, Marion. <laughs> uh, Joseph Alonzo. Hello, everybody. So, um, Alex Dillon, Nancy Khalil, Bethany Petch, Peter Rahill. Fun songs in the house. Hello. Um, Edmund Red says, amazing episode yesterday. Thanks a lot. You're welcome a lot, man. I had such a good time interviewing him. Element Studio, hello. Um, yeah, he's uh, an amazingly articulate and caring and generous person. Um, I feel really fortunate to have him as a friend. We only met, I don't know, three years, four years ago, something like that. I can't remember now, but... Uh, we met, uh, I, I cold called him. Uh, I'd seen his name around for a long time. I just cold called him and said, hey, hey, Glenn, let's, uh, let's, you know, let's get together for breakfast or lunch or whatever. So I drove to where he is and we had a really nice brunch together at a little like outdoor cafe kind of thing. Uh, very kind of earthy, you know, uh, cute little place. And Man, just a few minutes into the, that brunch, uh, I felt like I, I had met my long lost brother. And uh, I think we spent at least a couple hours at that brunch and have become pretty darn close since then. And I just, I admire his depth of knowledge, his generosity, his personality, just on every level, uh, just everything about that man. So really, really glad that uh, you guys could hear him yesterday. Um, so for today's episode, I'm going to get to a couple of questions that you guys had posted in the, um, in the comments. Uh, I think the day before we had that episode that was cut short by YouTube's uh, meltdown. Hey, John Pearson, how are you? Hello, Spiritual. Uh, Michael McGraw. Um, so I'm going to answer a couple of those questions, then answer a couple that were posted uh, in the chat or I mean in the comments after yesterday's Mystery Music Supervisor episode, and then fill you in on something regarding him. Um, okay, so I can't remember if I answered this one. I think I might have gotten to this one the other day before we got cut off, but uh, um, Alex Dillon wants to know if Mystery Music Supervisor will be at the road rally. Yes, um, I think he will be at every road rally for the rest of our lives, if I have anything to say about it. And I know he really enjoys it, so I think that's a, a pretty good yes. Sorry, I just, uh, man, excuse me, I was feeling a little tired. So I made myself, uh, my wife brought back some um, Turkish, or no, actually somebody sent some Turkish coffee from Israel uh, to our house. And it arrived a few days before my wife got home. And uh, so I made some Turkish coffee and, and have had about half of it. It's so good. It's the kind where you just mix the grounds right in with the water and then let it settle. But I didn't want to be spitting out grounds during the episode, so I poured it through a filter afterwards. Edmund Red says, yes, it's super strong. <laughs> yes, it is. It's so delicious, though. I can't believe it. Uh, hello, Betty Anderson. Uh, Jesse J. Peck says NASCAR race delay. Um, yeah, I don't know if I can drink it either. If, 
If I have a, uh, a heart attack before the show's over, you'll know why it's on. that coffee did it to me. Anyway, Glenn Letts asked, uh, Michael, you were asking about ideas for Thursday's Quarantini show. Here's a couple. What do you think about a show discussing a step-by-step -step approach to a simple instrumental taxi listing? Um, okay, so I did one of those with Steve Barden. I think it was actually the first time I ever had Steve Barden on the show. Um, I had him do a simple instrumental with an acoustic guitar and a dobro, I believe. So if you go to our YouTube page and look under videos, um, you'll find it was probably about four years ago, and you'll see probably see uh, Steve Barden's face on the, the thumbnail. So check that out. Um, unfortunately, I didn't realize at the time uh, my external microphone wasn't working, so it was using the mic on the camera uh, on the, uh, you know, uh, webcam and, uh, it was picking him up from several feet away and I was behind it. So I'm not very loud. So the audio leaves a little something to be desired, but the content is really good. So definitely check that out again with Steve Barden three, four years ago, something like that. Um, Glenn went on to say also a few shows ago, you mentioned IMDB pro over IMDB. How would you use Pro versus the plain IMDB? Honestly, um, the one thing that I use Pro for is it gives you more in-depth information about productions. Um, on IMDB regular, you can see who the cast and the crew are, but if you go into, and this may be more applicable for taxi or for publishers than it would be for individuals, but I'll go in and I'll search um, you know, movies being made within a certain budget range that are either in production or in post-production, and then look at the log line. Well, I think I talked about this the other day, maybe repeating myself, but I think it may have been cut off. So I'll look at the, the timetable. You know, if something's in post-production, that's a good time to reach out, um, and it'll probably say who the music supervisor is, and I'll look at the log line and see, you know, if it says... Uh, um, American hippie coffee grower goes to Turkey in search of the best uh, Turkish coffee roasters, um, then I might, uh, if I were a really uh, proactive person, I would start creating maybe some Turkish sounding instrumentals then reach out to the music supervisor or the executive producer and say, hey, I've got a stash of, of Turkish instrumentals. Would those be of any use to you for that film you're working on? So there you go. Oh, good. Ariana just posted a, a link to the uh, Steve Barden uh, thing I was talking about a little bit ago. Um, Uh, so anyway, that's how I, that's one of the ways I would use IMDB Pro versus regular IMDB. Um, it's just always good to know that, you know, who's working on what, what kind of budget, where, you know, anything the log line might tell you. Um, and obviously the bigger the movie is like, you know, if it's a blockbuster, if it's a Steven Spielberg film or something, you know, with a huge director and a huge cast and, you know, it's a hundred million dollar budget movie. The chances of you getting something in a film like that, not that great because they've got the budget to license the, the big songs from the big artists. Um, so they're probably not going to use a lot of stuff, not to say that they won't ever. I mean, I watch every time my wife and I go to the movies, we watch all the credits all the way through to every song credit. And usually there are one or two songs that made it in there from a library. A lot of times it could be uh, like public domain classical stuff. Some libraries specialize in that. Um, it may be, uh, you know, some vintage 50s music. Um, not a lot of stuff from libraries or people like you, you know, <laughs> versus the Rolling Stones. You know, I'm not saying like you, like you're on a lower level, but if they've got the budget to license Rolling Stones, you know, are they going to pick one of us versus them? Probably not. So there's that. Um, Justin Mather uh, commented that on, on the Melanie stuff that I played the other day, was it last week? Yeah. Um, that the reverb sounds good, perhaps a little long, but still so natural sounding. 
Yeah, well, <laughs> it was the you know the late seventies, and reverbs tended to be a little longer. But like I said, I, I mixed most of the songs on that album in like an hour to two hours. Um, and looking back, as is the case with every project I ever worked on that ever made it to vinyl or to a radio station, I hear this stuff in grocery stores and go, oh, I wish I had done that differently. So yeah, there are songs that have a little bit too much reverb and the reverb's a little bit too long. But did I have an hour to start playing with mic placement, speaker placement, and moving blanket placement in the chambers? Uh, you know, to do that for half an hour or an hour um, to get a mix right and then uh, and then move on to the next song where I wanted longer reverb. No, I didn't. So uh, sadly, I've had to live with that for 40 some years. Um, uh, Robert uh, Velicor, uh, Velicors, yeah, want to know if the acoustic guitar was done through a direct on that Melanie record? No. Absolutely not. As a matter of fact, there were times that we had two acoustic guitars playing live in that room with electric guitars, with drums, with the audience, everything. And no, those guitars uh, were mic'd. And if I remember correctly, Melanie's guitar was mic'd with an 87. So I, had, I think I had an 87 on her vocal and then another 87 um, on her acoustic guitar. And she moved around a lot. Um, but I got to say, her guitar sounded pretty darn good. Uh, it picked up some of her vocal, obviously, as did almost everything else in the room, because she could really belt stuff. So that's one of the reasons why we didn't go back and fix any of the vocals. There was vocal bleed everywhere, but we knew that was going to be the case going in. Um, Andre Stepanian wants to know if we used a metronome or we just went for it. No, there was no metronome on that record anywhere that I remember. So. It was all just, you know, the band did. Somebody asked, um, you know, did they do a lot of pre-production rehearsal? Yeah, before I even met the band. I mean, I'd spoken to Mel and her husband, Peter Shakarika, on the phone a couple times before we started the record, but didn't know any of the band members. Um, and, and they did, I'm guessing, a week or two of, of you know, pre-production rehearsals. So they walked in and they knew their parts. Um, did they come up with a few ideas for parts after they heard a track, you know, and really loved it? And, you know, can we, would it be okay if I added this? Sure. So I would add those parts after I edited the two inch and had the final version because it made no sense to add a part, um, it, you know, because we were cutting things up. I don't think very many of the songs made it to the record without me editing the the 24 track two inch but i am going to play one on today's show um that you're going to hear that was direct from two track i was not able to get a mix that i was happier with than what i had going on in the monitor mix in the control room during one of the nights when we recorded this song and uh i, I just thought the <clears throat> the vibe and the sensitivity the song is called Together Alone. Maybe I'll play it for you in a couple of minutes. Um, I, I remember the hair in my arm standing up and, and, and just looking at my assistant engineer in the room going, oh my gosh, this is amazing, just for vibe and feel. Um, unfortunately, the version that I found on YouTube, uh, the one I found on Spotify just sounded horrible. Um, it was really tubby sounding. I, I think that they remastered the record before it went on Spotify, and the whole thing just sounds like crapola to me on Spotify. Um, the version that I found on YouTube, I think, was from that same batch of remastered stuff, and it still sounds pretty darn tubby. It's got a lot of bottom on it, and the top end is not nearly as open as like what we heard on the vinyl the other day. But the reason I want to play it for you is to make the point of um, how vibe and feeling and authenticity win over a perfect mix or a perfect performance. I mean, there are places in the, the one I'm gonna play for you where Mel got a little pitchy maybe. Um, I, I can't remember, is it the piano? No, not the piano. Something was out of tune. I think there were some guitars that were a little, little bit pitchy, but the vibe was just there. And I remember just being so blown away during the recording that I got out of my chair, went through the airlock and tiptoed out into the studio and went, Shh, 
everybody just be quiet. I didn't want the audience clapping because I had the mics open pretty damn hot for that take so that I could capture all this ambiance in the room and the vibe. And I didn't want anybody to clap at the end of this because I was afraid that they would just, you know, peak the meters, blow out the tweeters on my JBL 4311s. So there's no clapping at the end of this. And uh, if I remember correctly, my assistant, uh, I gave him the universal sign for fade it. And he brought down, <laughs> he brought down um, the master uh, fader. And that's what went the two track. And I sat there trying to remix this thing and I just couldn't beat what was on the two track live from my monitor mix. So although it's imperfect, there's something special about it and I want you guys to hear it. Um, yeah, auto tune it. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's see. Dan Weber wanted to know if Melanie wrote her songs. Yeah, I would say the majority of her material was written by her. She's a great songwriter, a great artist, a great vocalist. I really don't know, you know, she. I'm in my mid-60s. She's older than I am, and she still tours. I mean, she will get on a plane and fly to Japan and still play um, probably like two to 5,000 seaters. She's got a really strong fan base all over the world. Um, I, I loved working with her. We still keep in touch. Here's a cute story for you. Um, when our daughters were younger, they were probably like two and five years old, and we would put them in their car seats, uh, and we would buckle them in. One of the songs, which I guess I could play for you today, one of the songs from that Melanie record from Ballroom Street was called Buckle Down. And I don't remember if she wrote that one or not, but it's kind of a, uh, you know, like a beer hall song. Um, uh, you'll hear it. A and uh, it's very sing-along-ish. And so we would put it on in the car uh, to support the fact that we were buckling our kids in. And our kids learned the song lyrically. They would sing along with it all the time. So I was on the phone, you know, this was like 20 years ago. I was on the phone, so this is 20 years after the record, but 20 years ago. And I was on the phone with uh, Melanie and or her husband, uh, Peter, who was still alive at the time, and telling them how cute it was that my kids knew the lyrics to Buckle Down. And they would, every time we'd get in the car, play Buckle Down or play Melanie, and we would. And uh, so about a week after I was telling Melanie about this, a CD showed up at my office, and Melanie and her son, who had then become, uh, he was probably in his 20s, had become an engineer, um, and a performer, and a producer, and they did a remake of Buckle Down called Buckle Up. And at the beginning of the song, uh, Hannah, or, uh, Melanie says, Hello, Hannah and Gabriella. This is Melanie. I'm so glad that you love my song. Here's one just for you. And she redid the lyrics to Buckle Down as Buckle Up, just for Hannah and Gabriella, which I thought was adorable. And, and we all still remember that. It's a cherished memory. Um, uh, Jay King, Jai King, wanted to know, uh, forgive me if this is an old question. Have you covered mastering as it pertains to our submit our submissions, or does that matter? Um, that was something that hung me up on my master's degree project, so I have some insecurities about it. There is no easy answer to the question about mastering stuff before you submit it to Taxi. Um, I asked different library owners. Um, some guys say, yeah, you know, but they don't want it mastered like you would master, you know, uh, an Adele record or, you know, a Pink record, some big artist record. It doesn't have to be that level of mastering. Should you run it through some mastering software to make sure that, you know, that it's not peaky and that uh, the EQ sounds kind of uniform? Um, yeah. Um, some libraries like to master their own stuff and don't want you to pre-master it because then it makes it harder for them to master it yet again. So there is no one answer fits all scenarios, I'm sorry to say, Jai. Um, Zuma Show said, my submission reviews from Taxi were helpful. Made me realize a music career is not in my cards. You know, we get that from people sometimes. Um, for all my carefully crafted hooks and heartfelt lyric attempts, uh, when I like the music intro, he says in quotes, is the most 
Oh, oh, he's quoting the screener. Excuse me, when I like the music intro is the most positive element of the review by the screener. Um, it's time to get a real job. Save me years of wasting my time. Uh, my money was well spent on taxi, and I paraphrase that a little bit. You know, that takes a really honest person who um, can look at that. You know, uh, I always hate to see people walk away from pursuing their dreams. But, you know, sometimes it's just in the cards for people that they make music because they love to make music. Not everybody is out to make money with their music or looking for commercial success. Some people just love to create because it gives them, it, it feeds their, their soul to do that. So if that's what uh, Zuma Show learned by submitting and getting feedback from the screeners, you know what? I really applaud your honesty and the fact that you were able to objectively look at something that most people couldn't. So hats off to you, congratulations. Um, I'm glad that you found value. Um, Happy Ron Music says, uh, if Michael and all the guests always tell us basically the same thing, why don't we listen? Why don't we all listen like we should? There you go. <laughs> um, all right. So that's that stuff. Now, I want to... Um, Let's see. Uh, oh, one of the questions that was asked, and I didn't write down who wrote this, but it was asked after yesterday's show with the Mystery Music Supervisor. Um, somebody wrote uh, th that he mentioned, you know, not writing for sync. Write what is true to your artistic soul in so many words. And again, I'm paraphrasing. Um, I was moderating a panel somewhere about a year or two ago and, and something great was played on the panel and i remember several of the panelists said did you read they asked this of the person who wrote it and sang it and uh, they said did you write this for sync or did you just write this and the answer was no i just wrote it what they're looking for is authenticity and you know look um again this is one of those things where there is no absolute answer there are some people um the Highfields are a great example of they started out writing purely for their own selves, you know, uh, and then they got turned on to the sync world and probably more specifically writing for advertising. And so they chased that by learning how to write for sync for ads. But then they realized that they weren't getting a lot of traction even with that. Even though they'd gone leaps and bounds ahead of where they were, they realized that they needed to get back to that melding of their authentic artistic vision in a way that worked for sync. And I believe that that is where you wanna be. So you need to combine those two skill sets. Um, if you write purely from the heart, but your lyrics just aren't gonna work for sync, then they're not gonna work for sync. If you write purely from the heart, but you know as you're writing that you should avoid certain aspects, uh, you know, things that are specific mentions of times, places, names, profanity, brands, all those, that laundry list of things that you shouldn't, it just becomes part of who you are as a writer and allows you to still write from an authentic, <clears throat> excuse me, an authentic place. So I believe that that's the answer. Um, somebody else asked, um, I believe that they said, uh, and I just made short little notes this, but somebody said that the Mystery Music Supervisor mentioned something about writing for current trends. Is that something that we should do in sync? And I think the person who asked the question said, um, I've noticed that a lot of things that are trending uh, on radio, on Spotify, that they do, those current trends make it into sync but it, there's usually some lag time. I think the, the person who made that mention said something like six months, and I completely agree with that. Um, I would say, you know, 70 or 80, maybe more uh, percent of, of the music that's used in TV shows and films is in fact music from the current day because that's the time period with during which most things take place, obviously films that take place back in the day or films that are futuristic wouldn't use music of today. 
but most do. So yeah, they're looking for music that sounds like today. And, and um, so there you go. Uh, they want stuff that sounds current. Makes sense. Not to say that stuff that sounds futuristic or um, vintage won't work in some, sometimes many cases. Um, somebody else asked a question that we get asked a lot. Um, should I register for PROs before making submissions? Well, yesterday, the mystery music supervisor, I think alluded to the fact that uh, he likes to go in um, when he's thinking about using something and, and check with the PRO to make sure that it's registered and everything is kosher. Here's the difference. He is a music supervisor getting ready to put something in. A music library who is thinking about signing an instrumental tune of yours, if you're already if you've already registered that cue or that instrumental with your PRO and the library is going to become your publisher, then they are going to want to have the publishing reflect I mean the PRO registration reflect that they are in fact the publisher. Um, so I think in many cases, libraries prefer to get stuff that's not registered because that way it's a fresh registration versus going to make a, um, a new registration. Excuse me. Well, my nose is tickling, probably that Turkish coffee. Um, yeah, John Pearson says, I register everything with a PRO except for instrumental. So yeah, maybe that's, a, that's the rule of thumb is instrumentals that are likely where you're going to then be published by the library um there's really no need to register with the pro because it's going to get registered by them and you're still going to be shown as the writer on it um for songs um it, it would be a less typical circumstance that a music supervisor would ask for instrumental cues you know, somebody who's working on a reality show, they generally don't reach out to the public saying, hey, you know, I need a dramedy cue for this scene in The Kardashians, my favorite show. Um, so, yeah, there you go. If they're not going to ask you for a direct submission on something like that, um, then there's no need to register it with the PRO. And the chances are, if it's going to end up in The Kardashians, it's going to go from you to a music library and then to the Kardashians and the library is gonna register it. So there you go. Um, wow, I can't believe I've been talking for almost a half an hour about this stuff. Um, all right, one more sip of this jet fuel coffee and then let's listen to the Melanie song. That sounds so, I mean, that tastes so good. <laughs> I want to, I mean, there's like two ounces left in the bottom of the cup. I want to drink it, but I'm afraid I'll be like, because mm, I'm already a little twitchy. Um, yeah, Mark Ryle uh, says, Mystery Music Supervisor was right. Right, what makes you happy? Life is too short. That's true. But if you gain the skills and the knowledge about writing for sync, I believe that you can meld those two things. You can be a sync centric writer that still writes from the heart. The two are not mutually exclusive, right? That's <laughs> even the aftertaste is like stunningly good. <laughs> I want to go after the show's over today. I think I'm going to go make another cup of this stuff. I'm going to be up till four o'clock in the morning. All right. Let's listen to a little more Melanie. Okay, again, for people who've just joined us, uh, this song is called Together Alone. It was from the album Ballroom Streets. I believe she probably cut it on other albums. This was a version done live in the studio with, uh, we did like 10 nights of a complete double album album as a live performance end to end with an audience of 30 strangers who won a contest on the big local radio station in Miami at the time. Every night they would file into the studio, they would be stoned, they would have wine skins. Remember those wine skins everybody had in the 70s, um, you know, filled with wine, they would bring in beer. Basically, they were all buzzed and they were sitting on the floor scattered around uh, the different band members. I think we had somewhere around six, seven, eight players live at any point in time. We had live drums in the room in a uh, semi-open drum booth. 
Um, so the drums leaked into the room. We usually had two acoustic guitars going live. We had Melanie singing vocals live. We had some background vocals going live. Um, we had uh, usually two electric guitars live in the room. Um, we had uh, acoustic piano live in the room, uh, a couple of synths live, and it was either, in most cases, coming through wedge monitors um, because the band members wanted to hear what the audience in the room heard, and uh, there were very few overdubs on this record. So, this thing that I'm going to play you was a song where, I, as I mentioned, uh, I think the other day and earlier in this episode, I'm just catching up you late arrivals, that I ran monitor mixes, obviously, in the control room. I was constantly bouncing between my mix in the control room um, and the different mixes that I had going to the different monitors out in the studio. So this was a two track that was running live during the entire performance every night. And this was my live monitor mix. It's also something that went through remastering and this sounds really tubby. Um, check out the snare drum on this thing. This is not a sample. As a matter of fact, a certain multi, 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 multi platinum uh, engineer friend of mine um, heard this snare sound and just isolated it and sampled it. Um, maybe it's made its way to some of his famous records. Who knows? Uh, anyway, let's have a listen. Okay, here we go. Melanie, Ballroom Streets. Um, together Alone. Listen to the vibe. Let me know how my levels are. We'll grow old. We'll take care of each other. I'll be sister. Mother and lover will be friends. During changes of weather, let's be together. Wow. 
So yeah, remember at the end of that, I was just loving the takes so much that I actually got up out of my chair and tiptoed out into the studio and went, shh, everybody be quiet, don't clap. Um, yeah, it, it was a P bass. I think, uh, uh, what was the, the bass player's name? <laughs> I'm looking. Whoa. Come back. And Poppy Paul. Yes, I tried really hard to fix this uh, situation and, uh, with the uh, autofocus. And for some reason, my software won't let me do it. Um, I can't find the bass player's name at the moment. Um, oh, Bob Leone. What a cast of characters, huh? <laughs> okay, so that guy was the bass player. The guy with the black shirt next to him um, was Robbie Georgia. He was the guitar player. Obviously, that's Melanie front and center. Um, Stan Kipper was the drummer who was excellent. Um, the girl sitting down in the back with the white shirt on, I think, and the dark hair, her name was Pat Sturialli. Um, and she was the live-in girlfriend or wife of that guy, um, who's the, oh gosh, what was his name? Um, I can't believe I can't remember his name. Hmm. I can't find it on here. Anyway. Um, he was the guy that played guitar on a bunch of Simon and Garfunkel stuff, including The Boxer. And this guy and I have remained friends ever since. That's Tony Battaglia. Remember um, Jay Ferguson? Um, Tony played on a lot of the Jay Ferguson stuff. I think he played on some Eagles stuff. He, he was very close friends with that whole like Bill Simzik, Eagley, Joe Walsh crew. I think he might actually be on a couple of Joe Walsh records. I don't know. But anyway... Great band, really, really great band. Um, there were a couple other guys that <laughs> had gone home before that photograph was taken. There I am. Um, Thunder Island, yeah, Jay Ferguson. Um, here's the album cover. She'd obviously signed that when I got that off the internet. Mel had signed that for somebody. That was just shot in a neighborhood about two blocks from the studio at like, you know, five o'clock in the morning. Gee, why was everybody still up at five o'clock in the morning? I can't imagine. Um, Michael, do you recall the brand of the snare drum? I don't. Um, I had a Black Widow snare that I bought and kept in the studio. It could have been that one. Um, I remember it was a really big, deep snare that was black. I think it might have had a brass shell on it. I can't remember. Um, yeah, oddly enough, they are. They're sitting on a taxi. How funny is that? Um, all right, let's see. I'm going to play Buckle Down, see if I can find you that. Okay, um, this one again is from that remastered stuff that just sounds way too tubby. Um, how do you mic a Leslie speaker? Um, it's a matter of preference, but I remember on that, I just had a 57 on either side of the top of the cabinet where the whirling horn is. And I think I used a, a Neumann 47 FET on the bass thing on the bottom. So, and I think I panned the bass down the middle 
to keep it consistent with the bass guitar and other bass-like things, and then uh, panned the two 57s far left and right to get as much separation as I could. <laughs> Yeah, there's an ad. All right, waiting to get past that. This is one of those jobs where you have to let the ad play. There's the live audience again. There's a hole in my pocket and some milling to be done. In the wells out of water, praise the rain and curse the sun. Curse the rain and the flood as I go swimming down. There's work to be done, so buckle down Buckle down, everybody, everybody buckle down Buckle down, everybody buckle down There's a time to be lazy and a time to hang around But there's work to be done, so buckle down singing along. sea shanty song if you will um man i go back and listen to the drum sounds i got on that record considering you know it was live and in a room and yeah gotta say a little bit proud <laughs> yeah that's coming from two speakers that are right next to each other about four feet away from a mono microphone <laughs> how funny is that uh, uh Anyway, yeah, so that's it. Any questions from you guys? Uh, I got nothing else for the rest of this show. I can just sit here and look at you. Um, the sound today is great. I haven't changed anything, so I'm glad it's great. Uh, nice that you can still dig on and appreciate your successes, Michael. Thanks, Peter. I'm so proud of that record. Just, you know... It, Maybe not the most uh, famous record that I worked on, but certainly the one that challenged my engineering skills the most. And uh, it was a 
excuse me, a really hard record to do, but really, really fun and really satisfying. Glenn Johnson, how about an online road rally this year? Uh, that's a discussion I don't even want to have. Um, does a certain vintage library have access to that one, Michael? Uh, no, I don't believe. As a matter of fact, I think that the writer share of the publishing even got sold for those songs. Uh, what microphone, who mastered the songs? I don't know. Somebody who's mastering I don't love. Sorry to say if mastering guy is watching or girl. Um, I'm using an Audio-Technica AT2020 USB microphone. Um, good mic. Darren Moss. Uh, do you hear songs you worked on come on the radio from time to time? Yeah, mostly in grocery store speakers in the ceiling. That happens a lot. I, I, I actually like grocery shopping, and I'll be in the grocery store and hear stuff that I worked on all the time, and I always laugh going, well, that, that's my destiny is uh, to hear my stuff in the grocery store. Yeah, I want to run up to people and go, hey, I did that record. <laughs> Get away from me, creepy dude. Um, El Rosso says, yeah, we could have some of the rally talk streamed as a European going to the rally is very difficult. I know it is, but you know what? A lot of people, probably 20 or 30 percent of the people that come to the road rally, that come from places like Spain. We get quite a few people from the UK, Germany, Switzerland, um, people from Asia. I mean, it's crazy. We get people from Singapore, from Japan. I mean, the Philippines all over the world. And I'm always so grateful that they come that distance because I mean, the, the longest flight I've ever been on, I think it's 15 hours. Man, you're toast after that. The fact that these people fly in, some of them come a day early just to get, you know, get their wind back, as it were, before the rally starts. I'm amazed that they're even able to stand up or, you know, not fall asleep in the panels, but they love it. Uh, and they come from all over the world. Yeah, John Pearson says, you're able to come. Please come to a road rally. It's not the same via VR, not even close. Yeah, you know what? The As good as the content is, and I'm really, really proud of the, the breadth of the content that we deliver. And, you know, yesterday's Mystery Man Music Supervisor is a great example of the level of quality information that you get at the road rally all day long, every day in the classes, in the ballroom, in the one-to-one, -one, you know, imagine being able to sit down for 15 minutes with a gentleman like yesterday's mystery music supervisor. That's what happens at the road rally. Imagine being able to go to dinner with him. I know several taxi members have been out to dinner with that gentleman, have had, you know, a drink with him, you know, in the bar. You can't get that watching a video. You just can't. Um, oh yeah, then there's the whole issue of, you know, music that we couldn't even put online. Yep. Um, Peter Rahill wants to know, so how long can you delay any notion of having to cancel the road rally? What's the cutoff date? Um, it takes me three months is pushing it. So November, October, September, August, you know, so really I need to know by July 15th. Um, there's so much work. I can't even begin to explain to you how much goes in. It's not like I just dream up some panel ideas, pick up the phone, call these people and they go, oh, yeah, sure. No problem. I'll be there. They've all got schedules The you know, and like I'll have somebody really good that I want to put on a panel and they'll say, well, I can't do the Friday afternoon thing, but I could do Sunday afternoon. So then I've got to reach out to the other three or four people on the panel and say, can you do Sunday afternoon instead of Friday afternoon? But then I have to think about, do I really want to put that panel on Sunday afternoon? Because it's something that should be learned at the beginning of the road rally. So people have that information in them for the rest of the rally. So there's just so much that goes into it. And that's just about the ballroom panels. Um, 
Darren Moss says, I've been to the rally uh, from Australia a few times. Really worth it. Uh, hoping we're allowed to this time. Darren, you have my deepest uh, appreciation for flying all that way. I can't even imagine coming from Australia and being awake for the road rally and having your senses with you. Um, Cass says, if it doesn't happen at the West and we'll do a taxi pub crawl. I don't, if we can't use the West, I don't think we'll be able to use pubs. We could just go up and down Century Boulevard drinking. By the way, when I went to the airport yesterday to pick up my wife, um, first of all, it's the only time I've ever made it all the way around the loop, uh, you know, at LAX without severe traffic. Um, so that was the nice part of it. But man, the homeless situation, as soon as you get off the 405 at Century Boulevard, it's like homeless camps everywhere. It's really, really sad. Um, Joseph Alonzo says, it's, yeah, it's like producing a TV show. I think it's worse than a TV show because we have so many elements going on. You know, what, what I'm doing for the ballroom, Angel is doing with the classes and the teachers. And then we've got to deal with um, taking care of sponsors who want to do presentations and scheduling people who are going to be um, doing a one-to-one -one mentor session. But then 15 minutes after that, they've got to be somewhere else. And we have to make sure that we have staff members assigned to rounding them up. Even, you know, they'll start talking to somebody after they do a one-to-one -one or after they do a mentor lunch. They get uh, pulled into a conversation, then they go to the restroom, and while you're trying to get them to get them on to their next thing, and we're talking sometimes like 30 people, then, you know, you've got, it, it's like herding cats. And those of you who've been to road rallies know, we keep that thing running pretty on time compared to most other conventions, very on time. Um, and it's extremely rare that we don't have somebody show up for a panel or something. So... There's a lot that goes on behind the scenes that the staff takes care of that I don't even know about, frankly, and I'm glad I don't, but it takes a lot of effort. Um, yeah, Creating Beauty says, wow, July 15th is around the corner. Um, yeah, I probably couldn't do it in three months normally, except I've done it, you know, now whatever, 22 or 23 times previously. So we've all kind of got our various responsibilities down to a science and we know what, what the problems are, how to, you know, anticipating things that'll go wrong in the planning stage. But, you know, we have things to consider like printing the road rally schedule in that booklet, getting the, the layout, the artwork done for that, getting all the bios in, getting the bios all proofed, um, getting the bios edited. A lot of the bios we get are, you know, like 300 words, maybe up to a thousand words. And we've got to edit those things and get them down to, you know, like 75 words in a way that won't affect or, or piss off the person that gave us the bio. Why did you leave this out? Why'd you leave that out? And we've got to do that for like a hundred different speakers, panelists, and mentors. Um, Yep, Robin Frederick's classes are amazing. Um, Michael, red or white wine? Um, neither for me, thanks. I mean, I love the taste of wine, but I get a headache from drinking. So if you're asking about me personally, <laughs> there's your answer. <laughs> um Greg Carosa says 12 hours from Albuquerque to the West End. I'm guessing by car or are you planning on walking? <laughs> uh, yeah, missed, uh, Peter Rahill says, missed not having Pat Patterson last year. Yeah, Pat was booked on something else. We changed the weekend of the road rally last year so we didn't collide with, the, uh, with Halloween. We don't want people to have to say, sorry, kids, you know, mom or dad's going to the road rally, can't go trick-or-treating with you. So uh, we, we pushed the road rally back last year an extra week so that we could accommodate the uh, people doing Halloween. How's that going to go this year? Halloween, you know, what are you going to do? Um, sanitize every piece of candy? Although, did you guys hear this or is it just me? Uh, I saw a blurb somewhere online that says the CDC has now discovered that um, COVID-19 is not very easily transmittable by touching surfaces. 
So does that mean that I don't have to sanitize every bottle of vitamin water before I bring it in the house or wash my avocados with hot soapy water before I eat them or bring them into the house? Um, Road Rally Costume Party, uh, Dean Crepain says, I thought everybody was already dressed in costumes. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, yeah, Jason Bloom was like on an author's retreat last year or something for like book authors. Uh, John Pierce says, I remember one year Bria was waiting for the printer delivery the day before uh, as we were stuffing bags. Yeah, you know, there's always something. Um, Creating View says, I don't think they know what they're talking about when it comes to COVID-19. So many stories keep changing. We should just be wise and act safely just in case. I agree. Um, Zuma Dog says, Michael, the fix is in. No more public events for a long, long time, no matter what the evidence says. I agree with you, Zuma. I am not in love with uh, our mayor or the governor. I, I you know... Look at the state of Florida. They've opened up uh, earlier and more widely than other states, and the number of deaths and the number of infections are dropping way down. As somebody so eloquently said on the news the other night, um, why are we quarantining healthy people? We should be quarantining the people who test positive or have it. Yeah. There's so much you know, that we're going to be hearing about for years to come after this is all over, and I hope it's all over at some point. Um, Marion Laird says, I saw something about using ultraviolet light. I'll be right back. You guys will laugh. So as I've mentioned on the show before, I'm a little germaphobic. I'm not so bad, you know, but... Uh, do I wash my hands a lot at the road rally because I shake a lot of hands? Yes, I do. Do I wipe down the tray table on an airplane even before COVID-19? Yes, I do. So about 10 years ago, my staff loved to poke fun of me. Um, <laughs> Zuma Dog says it's a deep state thing. Purpose, purposeful takedown, Garcetti equals Gar Shady. <laughs> yeah, uh, I don't want to say anything because I don't want this video to get pulled. But yeah, that's the world we live in. Um, anyway, so my staff got me this. A uh, there I am. That is a, uh, a UVC ultraviolet C uh, wavelength wand for um, they got it for me for like Hanukkah like ten years ago, and they were all laughing at me when they gave it to me. They thought it was so funny, uh, so I sent them all an email when uh, the lockdown started and said, "Who's laughing now, suckers?" Um, so yeah, every time uh, I unpack stuff from the grocery, you know, I wash my avocados and my bananas with the hot soapy water. Um, and then after everything is washed, including my yogurts and everything, and wiped down with little sanitizing wipes, I whip out the wand and do that over the stuff. I'm so careful. But you know, I, mean, I think we're starting to learn. It depends which network you watch, and I watch news on CNN, Fox News, and MSNBC because I want to hear all sides. Um, and there are some sides that I'm convinced are just trying to scare the crap out of us, but I don't want to get political. Um, <laughs> Peter Rahill says, I've got a, a lava light. Will that work? There you go. Um, so two minutes left. Any more questions? Dan Weber says it's infuriating to turn on the news. He stopped throwing his shoes. I actually yell at them now. No kidding. Uh, Martin Gravel says so much divergent information. Yeah, how hard is it to report facts? You know, just report facts. Speaking of divergent information in UV light, yeah, I'm having a hard time finding, I've found like four different answers on how long do you need to hover over stuff um, with the UV light before you kill the germ. Um, Jason Bloom last week was game changing and inspiring, says Zuma, um, remind people to watch it. Yeah, if you didn't see the episode with Jason Bloom last week, 
please do go into the video section where it says videos um, on our YouTube channel and find that and watch it. He's great. We're, uh, Jason did a thing on Melody and I thought he was really, really great. Um, Creating Beauty says, problem with quarantining only sick people is the incubation period is so long. Infected people can get so many others sick before anybody knows the first one is sick. Um, I'm not a medical expert, so I don't know, but I've seen a lot of stuff on the news where people are saying, you know, like they went to a party and three days later, everybody that went to the party was sick. Um, they say it's two weeks to be safe for the incubation. Who knows? Uh, Heidi Owen says the story keeps changing. We keep rearranging and something's just not right. That's so true. Um, Peter Rahill says, fun hanging out with y'all. Hope Liberty returns by July 15th. No kidding. Um, yeah, don't forget the, the virus, the Melody Challenge that we instituted during the Jason Bloom episode. Next week, uh, I will book Jason for a day where he is going to listen. I think you guys have a deadline of Thursday to get your um, submissions. I don't want to say the V word because apparently that was an issue that we used it so much on our episode. Um, yeah, Michael, your V challenge. Yeah, um, I'm not going to say the V word. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I think Thursday is the cutoff to send your submissions. Go back and watch the Jason Bloom episode. You'll see what the challenge is and get your submissions in. And then the week following this week, that would be next week, I'm going to play that stuff and Jason's going to comment about how the melodies were. Um, All right, with that, we are a minute over. Oh my goodness, I'm surprised we haven't been cut off by the network computer yet. Um, so that's it, uh, fun hanging out with you guys today. Uh, hope you enjoyed the, that big fat snare drum on the Melanie stuff um, and the vibe on Buckle Down and the vibe on Together Alone, which, I mean, I, I probably listen to that song like 10 times a year and just sit there going, wow vibe the sensitivity among the players they were all looking at each other knowing they were doing something special and just ad-libbing all those little delicate parts at the end it was really a sight to behold anyway thank you all um don't forget to subscribe if you're new and you don't subscribe already please go in and give us a like um and uh throw in some questions or comments in the comment section underneath the video once the archive is up today so that i've got something to talk about with you guys tomorrow and with that i bid you a fond farewell we will see you manana for another exciting episode of taxi's quarantini happy hour bye you guys